gyrative, Jai Masters. I thought tonight we would discuss something that should be completely obvious, but it's not. And very, very few people really know anything about it, yet we all talk about it as though we do. And that's the word will. Yogananda once taught in his lessons, he starts very big on will. He says, nothing happens in your life without will. You can't move a finger. Nothing happens. Will is the power that causes all your emotions and your actions and your words and your thoughts and so on. But you don't think about it. They're just there. So do you have the ability to lift your arm when you want to? In most people's cases, yes, they have the ability to lift your arm. For mass, your arm is mass, and to pick it up would require some energy, some effort, something is required to lift that thing. Gravity is going to hold it down. There needs to be a force that is applied upon it to overcome the 32 feet per second squared in order to lift that object. So we understand in the outside world, we have machines, we have this, we have all kinds of things. What is it that lifts your arm? What is the energy that lifts your arm? Well, doctors and different people like that will say, well, you eat food, and there's energy in the food. Okay, so does the food lift my arm? Come on, vegetable, lift my arm. That's not will. That may be energy that's available to apply, but what makes that arm go up? And the answer is you do. But that's such a cop-out answer. You do. Who are you? At some point, I love for people to think like this. You say, what is actually initiating and causing that arm to pick up and asserting will? I can't define will by using the word will, but that's what you're talking about, isn't it? What is asserting this willpower that causes yourself to walk when you decide to walk, that gets you out of bed? Isn't that easy to get out of bed? I once, I'm a programmer, right? I once looked at someone who tried to estimate what it would take robotically to get a robot to get out of bed. You have any idea how many moves that would take? This has to expand, that has to contract, and, and every, oh my God, wait till you see what you have to do to get out of bed. It's phenomenal. What is applying that will? Who told it to do that? And the answer is, yes, you're right. You do. But like I said, that doesn't explain anything. That's just words. What is willpower? So I discussed the other day, I dabble, I, I don't know anything, but I dabble with trying to at least get a surface understanding of the standard model of physics, what scientists are, are saying is, is going on in the world. And they say that there are four fundamental forces, only four. You don't have to be a genius to figure this out. There are only four forces in the universe that cause things to happen. And that's the force of gravity, the force of electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force. I never talk about those last two because they sound really, really complicated. They're not. They're really not. All scientists throughout the world, they agree in the standard model. That's as far as we've gotten to figure out what makes the world hold together and how it works. So if you say electromagnetism, you say, well, what's that? Well, there's a charge on electrons and there's a charge on protons, positive and negative, and they attract each other, and that's why atoms stay together. That's how big that force is. We're talking about fundamental forces. And gravity, we understand. That's why you're not floating off in space somewhere. You don't have to go, oh, they don't. It does it for you. There's a force. Just for kicks, so you don't be scared. What are the strong nuclear, weak nuclear? Well, I was taught, and so were you, that in the nucleus of every atom, there are protons, and they're all positively charged. How come we never thought to ask our fifth grade or eighth grade science teacher, wait a minute, positive forces repel each other, don't they? Try to take two positive poles of a magnet, ever done it, and push them together. You can't do it. There's this force pushing away. So positive or same negative repel each other. Opposites attract each other. So how come the nucleus stays together? Something has to overcome the electromagnetic force of the repulsion of positives together. Well, the force that does that is called the strong nuclear force. There, now you understand the strong nuclear force. 
I don't know that they know anything more about it. <laughs> they just know there must be some force that's overcoming the electromagnetic force of pushing the nucleus apart because there's all positive in there. There's neutrons, but they're neutrals. So that doesn't matter. Ever think about it? No, no one ever thinks about it. Isn't that neat? How come in school, when they taught us, I mean, teacher, you told us positives repel. So how can there be a nucleus of all positive forces? And the answer is because the scientists said, well, there must be. So we'll call it the strong nuclear force. The one that holds that together. Okay, we got that one down. Okay. Well, what's the weak nuclear force? Well, the strong nuclear force isn't strong enough to keep radioactive materials together. They have half-lives. They fall apart. That's why you don't want any of that stuff inside of you. It starts falling apart. Okay, what force is the minor force compared to the strong nuclear force? But it must be there because they do decay. I will call that the weak nuclear force. So you've got electromagnetism, gravity, strong nuclear force, and weak nuclear force. That is what all of science says are the only forces in the universe that are causing all things to be. That's why wind blows. Every single thing comes down to those forces. Really? I just moved my arm. Was that the electromagnetic force? It decided to move my arm? Well, no. I'm sure there's gravity holding my arm down. There could be electromagnetic repulsions, the air, who knows? The point is I tell the thing to move, it moves, doesn't it? And in fact, if you try to hold it down and I'm stronger than you, it's moving. What did I assert to make that happen? I asserted this force called will, and they don't talk about it. It is literally missing from the standard model of physics that there are things that move around in this universe, at least here, that are not done by those four fundamental forces. There's this force called will. Now, they have the right to say that that's not a physiological force in the outside world. Yes, it's not. It's not floating around out here. They didn't miss it. But isn't it funny that they picked up their vial and test and they're doing will all the time to do the thing. Can you willfully make thoughts happen? I'm asking you a question. Can you, I can only back my way into will. It's everything, but nobody really talks about it. Can you make a thought go in your mind? Right now, every one of you, I want inside your head, not outside, I want the word hello to be said over and over again in your mind. Did it do it? How did you make it do that? You asserted your will. It wasn't there before you asserted your will. When you stop asserting your will, it's not there. You have this power. Woo. It's like Star Wars or something. I don't know. You have this phenomenon. This is not, it's funny, but it's funny that we don't talk about it. It's funny. You went through school. Pay attention. Use your will. And you didn't say, what's that? I don't have any. Then what made your mouth move? Everything is being done through will. That's what's happening. So at least I'm talking about your will. So you can make thoughts. You theoretically have the ability to make an emotion. Ever fake cry? I don't care how old you were or anything. Try to get someone's sympathy. <laughs> you can make emotions happen. Okay, let's say that somebody hurts you. But you're an ego macho kind of lady. And you're going to show that stuff. But yet it was tearing at you. Can you put on a fake face? Can you put on a fake face? Can you hold your aura together? Can you put a smile on or make yourself cry? What do you use to make that happen? Will. There's one word for a will. Isn't that neat? Who talks about this? Nobody. Isn't that funny? It's everything. It is causing your ability to move physical objects and overcome gravity. It's causing your ability to control thoughts, emotions, and things on the mental plane, the emotional plane, whatever. It's not physiological, but your will still can control those things, can't it? Wow. Pay attention. Watch it happen. You'll see that every... Take a shower. You're using will every second of your life, aren't you? Both inside and outside. Well, maybe we should talk about will. That seems like a pretty important thing in your life, isn't it? Okay. Very good. What is will? Where does it come from? How do you have the right to assert that power to overcome even weight and mass and the laws of gravity and the laws of electromagnetism? Like I said to you, if you take a magnet and try to push the ends together, they repel each other, right? Not if you're strong enough and it's not that strong a magnet. You can go, there. You overcame the force of electromagnetism. With what? 
Was that the strong nuclear force that did that? No, I don't think you have control over that. Or the weak. Or was it gravity that did that? No. Isn't that neat? There is another force that they don't explain, that they don't talk about, that can overcome these other forces to some degree. And that is the force of will. It's strong, isn't it? It's really powerful. Okay, so take a breath. Where does it come from? I'll start at the highest level and work our way down. You're a conscious being. You're aware of things. You're aware of everything I just said to you. You're aware. We've talked about it many times. That's the witness consciousness. That's the self. That's the Atman. That's the soul. It's the indwelling presence of awareness, of consciousness. Will comes from there. Now, they don't know that. That's why they don't talk about it. You meditate enough and go deep enough, you will see that that's where all your will comes from. When you focus consciousness, can you, quote, concentrate? What does the word concentrated mean? Mean it made orange juice? In a sense, it does. It's saying you are concentrating consciousness. That's what you're doing when you concentrate. That's what you're concentrating. Consciousness. You're focusing it. All right? When you hold a magnifying glass against the sun, the sun's shining everywhere. You're not going to get burned up. Go hold yourself a magnifying glass of a sufficient power and don't aim it at somebody because it'll burn up wherever it's aimed, won't it? Why? It's concentrating the power of sunlight. When you concentrate, which, by the way, you use will to do, when you concentrate, you are concentrating consciousness. And consciousness is a great power. It's a tremendous power. Have you ever had to concentrate your thoughts, like doing math in your head or trying to remember something? What does it feel like? It's tensing. <laughs> you're, you're literally forcing willfully a concentration of consciousness, and it is a power. When you want to hold a picture of somebody in your mind, to so remember what they look like, you have to assert will. And if you don't have to assert will, because it's gotten ingrained, we'll talk about that later, it got ingrained in your mind, it's coming up by itself, and you don't want it to, like your ex, and it keeps showing up, what do you do? You push it away. Have you ever pushed it away? Have you ever pushed anything away in your mind or your heart? Isn't it neat? You don't talk about it. It's the most important thing you have. The most important thing you have is consciousness. Why? If you're not conscious, there's nothing happening, right? Or if it is, you don't know about it. Consciousness is the most important thing in your life, and I don't have to have a philosophy about it. If there's a whole bunch, I did this in the Untethered Soul, if there's a whole bunch of things in the room, a whole bunch of people in the room and things in the room, it's a party, okay? Take the people away. Are you still there? Are you still aware? Yeah, there's a piano, there's a chair. Take those away. You still aware? Yeah, the room's empty. How do you know? I'm still aware. Take your awareness away. How you doing? Gone. It's over. Awareness is the most important thing you have in your life. There is no life for you with no awareness. Even Helen Keller, they thought she wasn't in there, remember? She was blind and deaf and all the different senses weren't working. And what they find out, that she had touch. It's a beautiful story. She felt the touch. And eventually they found a means of communication by touching. And she was in there just like you. She's in there using her will and creating thoughts and having emotions. But she just wasn't receiving sight, sound, etc. That neat consciousness is everything. If you're not conscious, why bother? In fact, if you're not conscious, there is no world. But you don't know about it. There was a great master, Mayor Baba, who told it this way. He said, every object in the universe, every single thing that you've ever seen or ever thought of, your thoughts, your emotions, all these things are zeros. They're like a bunch of zeros. There's zeros all over the place. Okay? Well, what is zero worth? Zero. Put a one to the left of those zeros. What's it worth? 700 billion, trillion, quillion, zillion. That one is consciousness, and the zeros is form, is creation. It's a pretty nice way to look at it, isn't it? It gives everything meaning. That's the gift you've been given. That's who you are. You are the conscious being that's there. Fine. When you concentrate consciousness, when you concentrate consciousness, that's how you control your thoughts. That's how you control your emotions. That's how you make your arm lift. That's how you get out of bed. 
Come on, get a bit. I don't want to get a bit. Oh, all right. You put all that will and everything starts moving. Will, will. You've asserted will. And will is a power. In the ancient yogic philosophy, the Upanishads and the Puranas and so on, they talk about God being chit shakti. Chit shakti. Conscious energy. That's the nature of the divine force. It's aware and it's power at the same time. It's aware power. And that's what's underneath all of this. That's the quantum field. Consciousness emanating through its power, emanating particles and making atoms and creating all of creation. And yet underneath there lies the unmanifest, Brahma. That's what Brahma represents, the unmanifest. See, some people think that the Hindu tradition is polytheistic. Anybody who knows anything about yoga, about the understanding, the teaching, is not polytheistic in any way, shape, or form. There's just one force, conscious energy, that has created everything. But that force creates, that force sustains, and that force destroys. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. That's where all the gods and goddesses of the Hindu tradition come from. They're not gods and goddesses like the, like the Egyptians had and stuff like that, right? It's not a polytheistic religion. There are aspects of God, but underneath it all, it's one God. There's just one God. And they called it Chit Shakti. Chit Shakti, conscious energy. So there's that conscious energy. That conscious energy created creation. The unmanifest manifested the particles, and the consciousness is looking at what it created. That's who you are. Your will, the Bible talks about will, doesn't it? Man was given free will. You say, I wasn't given free will. Oh, yes, you were. <laughs> you have free will. You have free will. In other words, you can concentrate on anything you want. Look at that picture. No, look at that picture. No, look at that person. Look at You do anything you want. You're completely free. You have free will. You can aim your consciousness anywhere you want, and you can concentrate. You can concentrate on... If, I'm not going to make you do it. Don't, hold up your finger and concentrate on the tip of your index finger. Could you? Could you concentrate so much that that's all there is? Potentially. That's what meditation is. That's what concentration is in, in Patanjali. He talks about concentrating that deeply that that's all there is. Okay, fine. Now concentrate on your whole body. I want you to feel all of it at the same time. Can you? You feel your feet, your shoulders, your tummy, your head? Okay, you may not be good at it, but you can. That's consciousness focusing and expanding. Not the kind of expansion of consciousness in the 60s we used to talk about, right? But, I mean, theoretically it could be, all right? But that's just a little bit of expansion. But your consciousness has the ability of focusing on a single object or expanding out and seeing Look out, it's beautiful. Come visit out here during the day. There's beautiful fields and deer. You can see all of it at once, can't you? What if you saw all of it at once and all of a sudden a rattlesnake showed up? Shh! I guarantee you're not looking at the deer, you're not looking at the clouds, you're not looking at the tree, right? I'm teaching you something. It may seem silly. This is not silly. This is who you are. This is the answer to all of life, and this is the entire spiritual journey. So consciousness has the ability of focusing, doesn't it? It's not your eye that's focusing. It's your consciousness looking through your eye at a given spot or looking at it. Isn't it amazing? You can see it all or just see one tiny little thing. So your consciousness is who you are. You are the awareness of being. And that awareness can focus on little objects, big objects, whatever it is. Okay? And, and just because you're a good crew and I'm talking at levels I don't usually, your consciousness is not limited to what comes in through your senses. If I took one of my telescopes and set up in the field out there, and it has this tiny aperture of, in the side of its lens, you know, quarter inch or eighth inch aperture, and I go down there and I look down through there and I look at Saturn, I like Saturn, I look at Saturn, what am I seeing of the field? What am I seeing of the whole rest of the world around me? Zero. I'm only seeing what I'm looking at. It's all still there. You are not limited and I'm just going to tell you this. I can't prove it until you prove it for yourself. Your consciousness is not limited to looking through your eyes or hearing through your ears or touching this body. You just happen to be concentrating on those eyes, on those thoughts, on those emotions. Whose? Yours. How about this? Every thought that's being created right now in this room is in the same place. Just like the whole room's in the same place. Yes, there's a plank over there, but all the planks are in the same room, and I can see them all at once. Theoretically, you can see everybody's thoughts. Ah! 
theoretically, you are not limited to seeing your thoughts. Well, then why do I only see my thoughts? Because that's what you're concentrating on. You are completely fixated. If I was so in love with those rings of Saturn that I never came back, I'm looking out there and I'm down there and they're calling me. I don't hear anything because my concentration is completely out there through that lens. It could happen. But if the minute I get pulled away from the lens, then I see what's through my eyes. I see this stuff. You are not limited to seeing through your eyes in any way, shape, or form. A master knows that. A great meditator, a great being knows. I don't have to look down there through those eyes. I'm consciousness. I'm expanded. I, I, there's expansion of consciousness. Not It's already limited to you, but I'll not look at my finger or look at my body. It's not limited to you at all. It's way back up here, and it happens to be universal. Your consciousness is the consciousness of God. It's a consciousness of creation. It's what created everything. My father and I are one. There's someone who knew what he was talking about. And it's true of you also. Not of your body. Not of your mind. You, the consciousness itself, has no limitations. What limitation it has is what it's concentrating on. That's the only limitation there is. You are choosing to focus on your thoughts. You can say, no, I'm not. We'll get there in a minute. Well, what happens when you get addicted to something, okay? You're choosing to take that drug. No, I'm not. I want to stop, but I can't. Well, that's because you took it for so long that you forgot what it's like not to be dependent on it. And so now if you don't take it, it doesn't work. It doesn't feel good, okay? But your will did all of this. It started the drug. It made the decision. It had trouble with the mind and wasn't able to handle it. So basically, the consciousness is the force that's in there that's doing everything. But it concentrates on what it's interested in. That's what you concentrate on, what you're interested in. So if that rattlesnake shows up, just because it's said interested doesn't mean it's good. You're very interested in that rattlesnake. You have to have fun with the class. I said the following. It's a test. Multiple choice. You get a choice, okay? Here you are. You're enjoying yourself. You're having fun in this room. And someone drops a snake in the room. A big rattlesnake, Okay. You have a choice. You don't have a choice that the snake's in the room. You don't have a choice that you're in the room. That's given. It's happening, right? Do you want the snake in front of you or behind you? Not one of you is going to say behind me. <laughs> I tell you right now, no, I don't want to see where it is. I don't want to know anything about it. I don't think so. I think that sucker's sitting right over there, and you're looking at it, and you're watching it very carefully. Why? Because you're interested in it. You see, interest doesn't mean good or bad. It just means you're going to focus your consciousness on it. And there's how focus takes place. That's why you only see your thoughts. I don't ever talk about this stuff. That's why you only see your thoughts. Her thoughts are right there, right there, same place, same place. Wow. It's called the mental plane, and thoughts are being created. And how, how come you know, all of a sudden somebody calls on the phone from, from Europe? You haven't seen them for years. You say, oh, my God, I was just thinking of you. Ever happen? Thoughts are all over. There's no limitation. They don't take any time. They're not on the physical plane. Psychics can see your thoughts. And the result is the thoughts are thoughts. They're things. They're there. I knew a psychic. I don't get into all that stuff, but she was a very beautiful soul. But if you created a boat in your mind and saw a boat, she saw it. Why not? It's right there. No, you can't see it because you're busy looking at, what, what am my mother doing? Why did she do that? You're studying your thoughts. Just like you're interested in the rattlesnake, you're very, very interested in your thoughts, aren't you? So you're interested. And because you're interested, you focus willfully. Believe it or not, it is a willful act. It doesn't feel like it because now it's become a habit. And we'll talk about habits in a minute. That's another big spiritual word. Will is as big as it gets. Habits are number two. It's something that happens because you're used to focusing your consciousness in a given place. You don't have to assert new will. It goes there. That's what he used to call it. He said there was conscious will and subconscious will. Conscious will is you willfully do it. When I told you to say hello, you willfully, okay, I'll look at the picture. You do it willfully. If you do it long enough, that picture's staying in there. And nowadays, I guess they would say neuropathways get carved. It's really will asserted on an object that gets used to doing that, and it's hard to get rid of, it, isn't it? So it's like subconscious will. It's, it's habit-formed will, is what it's called. But it's all will. It's all will. So basically, you're the consciousness, and you're concentrating on certain things. What are you concentrating on? I know, teacher, my thoughts. Which one of you are not concentrating on your thoughts? In fact, right now while I'm talking, you're still concentrating on your thoughts. I don't agree with this. Oh, this is neat. I don't <laughs> 
someone's paying attention to those thoughts. There are thoughts being created, and your consciousness is aware of them. How do I know I'm concentrating on my thoughts? Because you know they're there. If somebody sits there and says, oh, my God, I just keep thinking about her. She won't leave my mind. How do you know? How do you know that you keep thinking about her? How do you know that your thoughts are bothering you? How do you know that when you sit down and meditate that your mind won't shut up? How do you know? I have a new book. I talk about that. Okay. I am a physician. There's no such thing as a bad meditation. But I didn't see white lights and stars and all these things. That's just another thing to be concentrating on. There's another thing to be aware of, another thing to put your will on. If you sit down and meditate and your mind doesn't shut up and you get up and you come to me and say, I tried it 15 minutes, my mind didn't shut for one minute. Here's what I get to say to you. How do you know? How do you know it didn't? How do you know that those thoughts didn't stop? I'll give you a secret. They don't stop all day. You're not paying attention. You're like in them. You're lost in them. Your thoughts don't stop all day. They're saying, well, there's a driver that this, and I want to do that. Oh, my God, I'm late. Oh, my God, there's more things to do. Oh, my God, how can I do any one thing? I'm so far behind. Where is he now? Is he being loyal to me? Is he not? Can I trust him? I don't. Those are thoughts. How do you know when you sit down to meditate that your thoughts didn't stop? Because you're a conscious being, and you're aware that those thoughts were created. Good. That's called witness consciousness. That's a level of witness consciousness. I'm aware that I'm here. And I called them my thoughts. What do you mean my thoughts? My is a possessive pronoun. If you say this is my umbrella, I'm not the umbrella. By definition, I'm the one that owns the umbrella. You are sitting there saying, I am not my thoughts. They're over there and they wouldn't shut up when I wanted them to. Therefore, you're not your thoughts. And you're not your feelings. Oh my God, you hurt my feelings. Whose feelings? But you said hurt my feelings. How do you know You hurt my feelings. Feelings are things you have. Do they just stay there all the time exactly the same? No, they come and they go and then they change. What if I say, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay, now my feelings feel better. (laughs) Who are you? Who's in there? And what's happening is you in there, the consciousness, is aware of what passes before you. And what passes before you is what comes in from the senses the thoughts that get created in your mind and the emotions that you have. The trouble is you're so interested in those. You listen to me now. This is the the eye, there's the rub. You're so interested in your thoughts. You're so interested in your emotions. And you're so interested in what comes into your senses that you lose the sense of self. You project your concentration on those objects so much that you're down here instead of back here watching them. I see a car driving by. That's fine. You can see a car driving by. Who sees the car? I do. I want that car. I wish I had a car like that. Oh, my God. No, that's the kind of car that my brother died in. It was years ago. I don't want to see that car. What is that? The car caused thoughts. Are you interested in those thoughts? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How interested? You could get lost in them, couldn't you? You do all the time. All of a sudden, they are who you are. You are your thought. Most people think they are their thoughts. If all of a sudden your thoughts are saying, oh, I like her. Oh, my God, she's beautiful. Oh, my God, if I could go out with her, that'd be so beautiful. What is that? That's me. No, it's not. They're thoughts. They're just like any other thought. A thought is a thought. A cloud is a cloud. A thought is a thought. An emotion is an emotion. There are things in the universe, not the physical universe, but on the mental plane, emotional plane. How do you know they're happening? Because I'm aware, I'm conscious. Is it the same consciousness that's aware you're having nice thoughts and aware you're having not nice thoughts? When you feel good, you know you feel good. When you feel bad, you know you feel bad. Is it the same you that knows that? Of course it is. There's just one of you in there. This is will. When consciousness focuses on an object of consciousness, how does it do that? By concentrating. By folk ooh, in the words, by I said focuses. What does that mean, focuses? I was focusing my sight through the aperture of my telescope. I was focusing my sight on the, on the window, on the, on the picture. I was focusing my sight on the whole room. It's pretty fluid, isn't it? God, sit with it for a second. It's so easy for you, you don't even think about it. You can concentrate and expand. and you can, Oh, my God. Can you look up at the stars at night when it's clear and just see this vast expanse? Now come down and look at the scratch on your car. Oh, my God. I was looking at the stars. Who scratched my car? (laughs) Wait a minute. That's a big change in consciousness, isn't it? 
Your consciousness is phenomenal. It's the greatest gift. It is you. It's who you are. You're in here. The kingdom is within you. You are the consciousness, and that consciousness is phenomenal. Maybe if there's time left, we'll talk about going back, the most expanded you could ever be. Right now, we said you could expand yourself to notice you know, that your baby's crying or that there's a scratch in the car or that your, your boss is yelling at you. You know, at the same time your boss is yelling at you, all the stars and galaxies are still there? Not to you. Because you are where your consciousness is, aren't you? And where is your consciousness? Wherever you focus it. Now, you don't think that's your will that focus it on your boss while your boss is yelling at you. It is a willful act. Someday you're going to find out that while your boss is yelling at you, you can be doing your mantra. No. Yeah, somebody once asked me, are you saying that in our everyday lives, when we're not meditating or anything like that, that while it's happening, while you're having an argument with somebody or while something's happening, that you can be conscious then and be aware of what your thoughts are doing and what the person is doing, or afterwards you can look back. You're a conscious being. You're conscious of what's happening. You're in the witness all the time. There's no coming and going. There is because what's happening is so interesting to you, doesn't mean positive, is so interesting to you that you are focusing your consciousness on it. You're limiting your consciousness to the fact there's a road running across the floor. There is also two trillion galaxies, but not in your world there's a roach, or there's somebody yelling at you, or there's somebody who hurt your feelings. Your consciousness is automatically focusing on what you're most interested in. I think it's very nice that you're so interested in a roach. They should be very proud. Look, she likes me. <laughs> Look at it. Everywhere I go, she chases me. <laughs> she wants to have a relationship. <laughs> in fact, you do have a relationship with the roach. Not a very good one, but... <laughs> Are you hearing me? This is all expansion and contraction of your consciousness, of the focus of your consciousness. It's all about the focus of your consciousness. This is why if I go, and, and I don't study this stuff, but I, I read them once. If you go to Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, which is the, the core of yoga, it's, it's pointed to by the great masters as one of the greatest things written, all right? Written a long time ago. He talks about the different states of Pratyahara, Dharana and Dhyana. Well, what is Pratyahara? The ability to withdraw your consciousness from the senses. You can't meditate if you're busy listening and hearing and looking. Your consciousness is still being drawn out through your senses. You're not meditating. That's not called meditation. Yogananda tells a story. He said that he had a disciple once who said nothing happens to her during meditation. She's meditated for a long time and she keeps trying and doing everything and nothing happens and Master didn't believe that was possible. Now, if you do his techniques, Kriya Yoga, whatever it is, and stuff's going to happen. And so he asked her, he said, well, where do you meditate? She said, in the living room. And is, is it quiet? She said, oh, yes, it's very quiet in the living room. Well, she says, do you hear anything? Well, the maid is in the other room and she's supposed to be cooking dinner and she always gets it wrong and I can hear what's happening there and I'm checking to see whether the sounds are what I would expect well, that's not meditating, <laughs> okay? Because you haven't performed pratyahara. You haven't withdrawn your consciousness from the physical senses. You're still out here listening to it, picking it up, all right? So the first is the withdrawal of your awareness, of your consciousness from the physical senses. Can you do that? You do it a lot of times. You know when you do it? When someone you really love a real lot hugs you, you can go bye-bye. Okay, there can be special moments that are so beautiful. You don't hear anything. You just close your eyes and you go inside and there's just beautiful energy flowing inside and if you don't hear nothing. It can happen with a beautiful sunset. It can happen with all kinds of things. It can happen because you got so scared and then you, you went into a state of panic inside and somebody's calling your name and you don't hear, you don't hear. Can it happen? So you all can do pratyahara, not willfully. <laughs> That's the difference. But it can happen sometimes. So the ability for consciousness, usually you do it by concentrating on something else other than your senses. Like I said, you feel love or this beautiful feeling inside. So your consciousness gets drawn into that and then you don't hear anything, see anything. doesn't matter. You're gone. You're bye-bye. It's not a bad place to go, is it? Don't be afraid. 
<laughs> okay? And so basically, that is what they meant by prayara. You would draw your senses. Then what's the second stage? Dharna. Well, what's dharna? Concentration. Well, I thought prayara was concentration. No, prayara was concentrating on something other than your physical senses. If you can sit there and concentrate so that you're not picking up your physical senses. And you know, when you, I, I kind of like to tell you, is it possible that you could go into a state at night, lying in your little meditation bed, we'll call it that, horizontal meditation position. There is such a thing. What's it called? Shavasana, okay? That's the totally relaxing of Shavasanas. So you go in there at night and you practice Shavasana. And is it possible that someone could come into your room and walk around your room and talk to you and you don't hear a single thing, nothing, you don't even wake up, you didn't even know they were there. Not only is it possible, you go there all the time. That is Pratyahara. You have withdrawn your consciousness from the physical senses. Believe me, they're still there. Your eardrum is still vibrating. So I don't want you to think of these things as weird. You have these abilities. Consciousness willfully withdrew itself from receiving the physical senses. Then what's the next thing? Dharna. Now that you have withdrawn your consciousness from being distracted to be drawn out by the physical senses, are you still there enough to willfully concentrate on something? A candle, the third eye, a mantra, your breath. I don't care. Are you still there, even though you're not being distracted by the physical senses, to practice one-pointed consciousness? Now, this is about will. Every bit of this, you see this, everything I'm talking to you about is will. How would I one-pointedly concentrate my consciousness? By concentrating it on one point. <laughs> That's how you do it. Master used to say third eye. You're going to a very great master and taught how to achieve enlightenment, how to merge with God. And one thing he said, he taught Kriya Yoga. Most of you have heard that. This is a technique that his lineage taught. And somebody once asked him, Master, is there any other technique to reach enlightenment, the highest state in this lifetime other than Kriya Yoga? And he shocked his disciples by saying yes. They stood up. What do you mean, yes? You've been telling us all this ever since we met you. And he said, yes, there is. They said, what is that? Take your attention, key word, take your attention, put it at the point between your eyebrows, and never take it off. There's a wonderful way to talk about will. First of all, what do you mean take your attention? Your consciousness can concentrate. It's what your attention is, that which you're concentrating on. So he's sitting there taking your consciousness and concentrating on what's called the third eye, the sixth chakra, concentrating it up here. He called this the center of Christ consciousness. This is the center. You always teach this, and you're going to find out that it's true, not because they said it, but because you're going to go deep enough if you practice properly that you will reach a state where you realize all of your consciousness comes in and focuses on the third eye and is distributed throughout the rest of your system. You don't know that because you're so busy downstream. You don't know what's happening, where the water's coming from upstream if you're busy drinking it down here. You have to be willing to not drink it down here to be able to see where it's coming from. So this is the center of will. It's the center of consciousness. It's the center of Christ consciousness, he called it. So that basically, when you focus your attention here, it doesn't go down there. Down there's not negative. It's just the fall from the garden. That's literally what it is. Your consciousness goes down, gets all involved with the body, gets all involved with your feelings and your emotions and your thoughts and your whole personal self, you know, that whole messy, messy thing that's down there. If you concentrate, you're not able to do it right away, but it's still fun to talk about. I'm going to talk about will. If you were able to concentrate your consciousness at the point between your eyebrows and not take it off while somebody's telling you how much they love you, oh my God, you're the most beautiful person I ever all right, or yelling at you or telling you that you did a terrible thing which you never did, okay? Can you stay here? Not a chance. You're capable. Why would you not be capable of putting your conscience anywhere you want? So the reason is because you're addicted to being distracted by your emotions and distracted by your thoughts, your personal thoughts. What I like. I don't like this. I don't like this. There. Okay. Because you don't like it, a thought is being created in your mind that's very, very powerful. Therefore, your consciousness is being drawn right there. And if you t- we're trying to hold it at a point between your eyebrows, you don't stand a chance. That's what you mean when you say, I fall, I get confused, I can't keep it. When I'm meditating, I can do something, but the minute I stop, somebody does something, somebody says something, something I don't like happens, next thing I know, I'm not there anymore. That's why. Because you're more interested in your thoughts 
than you are the point between your eyebrows. You're not willing to concentrate sufficiently at a neutral, impersonal point. Because impersonals, you want to go up above yourself. Christ says you must die to be reborn. That's what it means. Are you willing to let go of your personal self? Are you willing to not be Sally who's married to so-and-so? Doesn't mean you're not married. Doesn't mean they don't call you Sally. Doesn't mean you don't respond. But are you willing to say, that's not me? I mean, here. I am the consciousness that is aware that the thoughts respond to this and have preferences and so on. But I am the consciousness. This is what it means to transcend. This is what it means to transcend yourself. That's what it means to die to be reborn. That's everything Christ taught. Everything. It's everything Buddha taught. Everything. It's all the deep spiritual teachings. So basically, we're doing will. Will is the ability, the power that comes from consciousness itself. It's not separate from consciousness. When I hold that magnifying glass in front of the sunlight, it's not other than sunlight. Nothing changed. It's just concentrated. When you concentrate your consciousness, how do you do that? It's conscious energy, the shakti, the force of consciousness can concentrate. It can focus or expand. There it is. We talked about that. When it concentrates on your thoughts, then you think you are your thoughts. Notice you think you are your thoughts. They're so strong. You are so addicted to your thoughts. So basically it has this self-concept. And what is your self-concept? A collection of thoughts that your consciousness is addicted to. And the right word is addicted, just like a drug. You are addicted to paying attention to your thoughts and your self-concept. I'm this. I'm a 23-year-old girl or guy who likes this person and doesn't like that person. I've never liked that. What are those? Thoughts. They're thoughts in your head. Do they ever change? Just fall in love with somebody else and see if it changes. It's amazing to watch. Here's this person, has this self-concept, they like doing this thing, they're interested in those things, blah, blah, blah. Then they fall in love with somebody, and there's a different person who has different views and different opinions, and now their whole purpose of life is different. Those are thoughts. They're thoughts that change. Can they change? Have they ever changed? There are thoughts. They're not you. No thought you have is more you than any other thought you have. People make up different stuff. Oh, this is not working. I'm going to change my personality. I'm going to change how we interface with people. Have fun. Do a hairdo inside. You just have a different set of thoughts and a different self-concept. Yes, I used to believe that, but now I don't. It's okay. It's fine. I'm not saying you can't do it, but please understand their thoughts. So why do they feel so personal? Because you're focusing on them. If you didn't focus on them, it wouldn't seem so personal. I told you, this, this whole thing about relationships, it really shows something, and there's nothing wrong with it. You were focused on a given thing. This is what I wanted to do and wanted to grow up to be and who I wanted to be with. And I wanted to have children or I didn't want to have children, so on. Now go fall in love with somebody, really in love, strongly in love with somebody. And all of a sudden, now I want to have children. I didn't know what I was thinking about. I I wasn't ready yet. And all of a sudden, there's all this rationalization, all this stuff going on as to why these are the thoughts that I now am. This is me now. Does it happen? Okay. It's because consciousness is who you are. I'm going to cry. It's who you are. It's who you always were. And you are focusing on a set of thoughts. Freud figured out this thing about id, ego, and superego. He basically analyzed your thought patterns. They're all thoughts. It is this. The ego is that. Superego is this. They're types of thoughts. And he noticed how they got in there and why they are the way they are. But he's just analyzing thoughts. He's not analyzing you. If we ask him, Sigmund, does a person in there see these thoughts? Well, of course they do. Otherwise, they wouldn't react to them. If your superego says, don't do that. Can you literally hear your mother or father or preacher or whoever in their voice talking inside your head telling you not to do something? They are thoughts. They're not you. None of them. You are the consciousness that is aware of the thoughts. The trouble is they interest you so much, you're addicted to them, so that they bother you. And if they bother you, you pay more attention to them. And if something really bothers you, that's who I am. I'm the one who, I'm bothered by this. I'm not going to put up with this. I can't believe you bothered me. And I'm never going to let this go, ever. And if it tries to go away, I'm bringing it back. You'll be sorry. For the rest of my life, I'm going to suffer because you did that. So your consciousness becomes aware of whatever you're most interested in. That's what it does. That's what it is. And that goes for your thoughts. That goes for your emotions. And then what you do is you try to create an outside world. Wait, try to create? Who tries to create? Will. You assert will to attract people, 
to repulse people, to buy houses, to decide what you like, to try and make it happen. You are willfully asserting your. People say, I've learned to assert myself. Uh, that was a big thing in the 80s. So people learned to assert themselves. It doesn't change a single thing we're talking about. There's nothing holy about asserting yourself or not asserting yourself. What's holy is the self itself. So when you assert yourself, you're saying, I'm going to make a decision of my mind. This is what I believe. This is what I want to happen. I'm going to visualize it. I'm going to assert myself to get what I want. That is consciousness lost in the ego, defining itself as the one who likes this and doesn't like this and wants this, and I'm strong enough to make it happen. Yes, you certainly are. You're strong enough to take the power of God and focus it down on the scratch on your car and find out who did that. And I don't care what it takes. I am going to go online and I'm going to search this thing. And I'm, You're welcome to do it. You're welcome to assert yourself all you want. So that is an act of will. And that's what we're talking about. When you assert yourself, you're asserting your will. On what? On a given thought pattern. On a given emotion pattern. Believe me, I'm not taking it away from you. Because I couldn't if I tried. We are addicted to ourselves. That's where it is. The consciousness is fixated. One-pointedly fixated. One-pointed concentration. It's not that you don't know how to one-pointedly concentrate. You do it all the time on yourself. The question of dharana, according to Yoga Sutra, of Patanjali, is can you do it on something other than yourself? Are you capable of taking all that focus that you put on me I, me, mine, the Beatles song, I, me, mine. Are you capable of shifting your consciousness through an act of will onto a candle? I used to think, what is so holy about concentrating on a candle? What kind of thing is that? You know they teach meditation like that, one point of concentration. It's because you're taking your consciousness and focusing on something other than you. The candle will just do just fine. So will the rock. So will anything. Just focus your consciousness not on your ego and your id and your superego and your silly old mind and all your emotions. Me, 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 mine. Because it's addicted to doing that. And I'll tell you that you're going to taught that that addiction happened the same way a drug addiction happens by repeating this and creating a habit of your energy flow. This is an energy flow. That's what it is. Just like the light from the sun is energy. You have focused your consciousness, your chit shakti on this set of thoughts. And so now it stays there. If you don't do anything about it, that's what's coming up. You're thinking the same thoughts when you're taking a shower, when you're driving, same stuff coming up. And maybe it's about what happened 10 years ago. It just keeps bothering me. It's just, I can't get it out of my mind. Why? Because you concentrated on it so much when it happened that you built what we call some scar. You built a pattern in your mind where the energy flows that way and you can't control it. Ever have that happen? Ever get something in there that's hard to get out? Okay, that's because you did that. If when that event happened, now you weren't capable, I'm not yelling at you. If when that event happened, you let go, right then, fine, into every life some rain must fall. You used affirmation. You just basically started the situation of saying, I ain't keeping this in here. If I take this drug two, three times, it may be nice, but I'm not going to be able to stop. Why? Because it's nice. And all you have to do is like something, just eat a piece of chocolate cake when you haven't had it for a while. Just once. All right. The second time is easier to eat it, but it's not impossible not to. Have it a couple of times. See what happens. All of a sudden, every time you feel a little depressed, I'd like to have some cake. <laughs> right? In other words, I need something outside of me that will help my concentration get off of this set of thoughts. That's why you eat when you have a breakup. Because you're trying to find... God, this is so poignant. I'm going to say it slower. You're trying to find something that will attract your consciousness so that it's focusing on the chocolate cake or on the this or on the that, whatever the heck it is, rather than focusing on what's going on in my mind because I habitually burn this into my energy pattern so that it flows naturally that way. There, was that terrible that I taught you that? Do you understand that? Do you agree with that? Is it true? That's what you try to do. And that's why people drink and that's why people do drugs and that's why people eat and that's why people do all kinds of things. Nothing's wrong with these things. It's not a matter of right or wrong. It's a matter of understanding what's going on. This is deep stuff. It is what's going on, isn't it? My consciousness is drawn through the patterns it is used to thinking of. And what are those? The ones that had the strongest impact on me, either negatively or positively, while I was going through my life. They got stuck in there. Why? Because I concentrated on them. Concentration is a powerful thing. If you concentrate on something, 
It's going to get ingrained. They say neural pathways. That's fine. That's just brain. It's, it's more than brain, right? It's the entire energy flow from God down. Did you hear that? It's the entire energy flow from your super consciousness down into your mind and your emotions and your body. And it gets used to flowing a certain way. And that's why your thoughts keep coming back up and so on. If you learn to what I call letting go, you know I teach that all the time, an event takes place, it doesn't feel comfortable or it does feel comfortable. Careful. The more you focus on it, somebody said, I do it in the book, somebody says to you something really, really, I mean, really nice. Just, I mean, I, I never told you ever since kindergarten, we were in the same class, and now we're in college, and I've just, I, you walk on water for me. I just, you're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I've just been embarrassed to tell you anything about it. I just worship the ground you walk. Woo! That's not so bad, is it? Okay? And then they sit there and say, I, 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 do you mind if I call you? No. No, I don't mind. You know what's going to happen? You're going to think about that when they walk away. They don't have to keep whispering in your ear the same thing, do they? You did it to yourself. You keep whispering it over and over again, maybe even shouting it, <laughs> okay? And you burn it into your energy flow. And now what happens? You go home, and the phone rings. Whoa. I guarantee you, your heart will jump open. It will, oh, like that, right? And you pick it up, and, and it's one of those spam calls, like I told you. you know? <laughs> Free trip to Hawaii, TWS. <laughs> All right. Oh, what happens? You get disappointed. You did that. You weren't able to handle what got said to you. Notice I picked the positive one. No, what about a negative one? And you got this burned in there. All your consciousness is focused on that, and you can't get it off. And you're not even trying, by the way. You're just sitting there by that phone. I bet you just park by the phone and sit there and wait for the call. You've done it in high school at different times. Okay. We we getting an understanding of this now? And so basically, this is what's happening. You're burning pathways habitually. That's what a habit is. The energy will flow there habitually versus willfully. It's still will, but Master called it habit form will. You see it? It just will fall there naturally. All right, so now you understand what will is. I don't talk about this stuff at that level because unless you go deep enough inside yourself, I can't prove it to you that will comes from consciousness, that it is the power of consciousness concentrating. There, that's what will is. It is the power of consciousness concentrating. It creates, just like the sun emanates solar winds. It doesn't go anywhere. It's just emanating this. The self emanates this power of Shakti, and you focus it. You focus it. You don't even think about it. You just focus it. But it does it habitually. Something scares you. All of a sudden, you're afraid to go in the basement anymore. Because it was that strong. If when it happened, you neutralized it, I'm going to have to stop because we're running out of time. But this is an important talk. This, this is yoga. How do you like that? That's what we're talking about now. Everything I've talked about so far is yoga. Let's say you went in the basement, you heard a noise, you got real scared when you were little, and now you don't ever go in the basement ever again. That's silly. You just lost a room in your house because of what happened when you were five and you didn't even know what happened. All right? Neutralize it. What do you mean? You see it, and you say, I do not want this in here. And just sit there and say, that's fine. There are noises. It's just a noise. You don't know what it was. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. It's all about letting go. What does that mean? Using your will to let go instead of using your will to get caught. So to finish off Patanjali, so Dharana is the willful ability to concentrate your energy and consciousness wherever you want. So put it on a candle, put it on your third eye, Put it on a mantra. It don't matter. But just don't let it go where it always goes. I don't like this. Have I sat 15 minutes yet? Is it long enough? I want my mind shut. Maybe this is my mind shut. I don't. You can't do anything. Here it goes. It's all caught. God, he hurt me. That was 15 years ago. I don't care. It hurts so bad. I remember it all the time. You're supposed to be meditating. I am. I'm meditating on that. <laughs> <laughs> all right? So dharana is the ability to focus your consciousness, your awareness on something other than yourself. And that's not meditation. Dhyan is meditation. And it's in the simplest sense. It says, now that your ability to use will to focus it on one pointedness object, not on yourself, focus it on the self. Don't focus it on an object outside yourself. Bring it back to the source of consciousness itself. You understand the difference? One is you're concentrating on an object. The other is you're not concentrating on an object. You're just letting consciousness remain in the seat of consciousness. 
And Patanjali defines that as that's meditation, and that is meditation. Because when you finally pull it off your senses and you pull it off of your thoughts and emotions and your personal self and you just focus on something that's neutral, a candle is neutral. It's not yelling at you. It's not telling you it loves you, all right? And nor is a mantra or nor is your third eye. And you're just focusing. And then because you're not, it doesn't interest you that much. It's not a personal thing. Consciousness will naturally, by the way, to go from dharna to dhyana, it happens naturally. When you actually have focused this away from your personal self, there's nothing drawing your consciousness onto these things that interest it so much. And it will naturally find itself in a breathless state, pulled back. You're not doing it willfully. It's because you willfully stopped it from going out wherever it goes. You overcame the habit. And you'll start to, in the middle of your day, you've been watching TV. And all of a sudden, you just go into this beautiful beautiful transcendent state of complete peace and openness and then you start expanding and that that's now dying to be reborn that's where the great masters went and normally even if you get to these higher states to literally totally let go of the personal sense of self to where you're just willing to be the universe like it's neat to say you're the universe are you willing to be the universe because it means you can't be you all right i've said what i want to say and it's beautiful now you understand consciousness is everything Then it becomes will. What do you want to focus on? Who are you? What's your real intent? You go about your life, and you're going to use your will. That's perfectly fine. You're going to have relationships. You're going to have children. You're going to have all kinds of things. You have ups and downs, what kind of thing go on. Can you stay back here? Are you aware that you are the awareness that is noticing all this? You're not any of it. You're just aware. And what will happen is every single bit of your life will raise you Everything you go through. Sure, I have a beautiful relationship. It's not always so beautiful, is it? You have fights, you have disagreements. Those get used to let go. You just, they don't mean to leave the relationship. It means you say, okay, obviously it's not my whole life. I'm still here. Okay, be there. Be there. And just keep letting go. And you will eventually find yourself in a place with the source of will. It's, that's how I said, how do you know? That chichakti, conscious energy, is the source of all will. Because when you pull back far enough, you'll be out, and then you'll come back, and you'll see how coming back. When you come back from meditation or deep meditation, that's the most educational thing you'll ever have. Because it shows you how you got lost down there. It's very neat when you can go out and come back and go out and come back. You see what's happening, how these samskaras, these patterns are drawing you back and pulling you back. All right, I'm out of time. I don't want to be... Have you learned a little bit of will? I can't touch it for you. You do have will, don't you? Even your habits are will. They're habit-formed will. So this stuff you're struggling with, your diet and your this and keeping your mind quiet, it's all stuff that you just let happen because you weren't paying attention. You weren't ready. Now you can work your way back. All right, work with these things. Jagger